Hello and good morning on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you joining us on the East Coast. Welcome to the National Wraparound Initiative September, 26, September 16th, 2014 webinar, Intensive Care Coordination Using High Quality Wraparound for Children with Serious Behavioral Health Needs State and Community Profiles. I'm John Osowski, the National Wraparound Initiative's Program Manager, and I'd like to go over a few announcements before we begin today's discussion. First, this webinar is brought to you in partnership with the Technical Assistance Network, so our thanks goes out to them as well. Second, for best results, please check your settings in the audio pane if you are experiencing audio problems. During the presentation, you can send questions to the webinar organizer using the chat feature, but these questions will be held till the end. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted to our website within a few hours of the webinar's completion. Our URL, as shown on the screen, is www.nwi.pdx.edu. And now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our webinar host, Janet Walker. Janet is a research associate professor in the School of Social Work and the Regional Research Institute here at Portland State University. She's co-director of the National Wraparound Initiative and director of the Research and Training Center on Pathways to Positive Futures. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Janet. Well, thanks, John, and hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, this webinar is presented, John, could you switch the slide forward, please, um, by the National Wraparound Initiative, which is a core partner in the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, and that's a group that works with the Children's Mental Health Initiatives, or the System of Care grantees around the nation. Uh, next, please. So just a minute before we get into uh, the meat of today's presentation, I just want to take the time to say a couple things about the NWI. If you're not familiar with our work, I certainly encourage you to check out our website. Uh, the address is on this page, and John gave it just a minute ago. Uh, or just put NWI Wraparound into your browser. Uh, there's a lot of wraparound resources. You can sign up to get our newsletter uh, that comes out once or twice a month with information on the latest in wraparound research, resources, opportunities, conferences, etc. And as you'll see and hear about a little bit later on in the presentation, there are going to be some follow-up resources available um, based on the report that we'll be talking about today. So if you are signed up for the newsletter, you'll be getting uh, information about how to access those resources. Another thing that you can do on the website is register for the two remaining webinars that we have scheduled for 2014. Uh, one of, again, particular interest to folks who are on today is the September 30th webinar, um, and that's two weeks from today, same time, uh, somewhere uh, in between 11 Pacific and 2 Eastern for various people, depending on your time zone. Um, so office hours a little bit more casual, usually a smaller group, uh, more of a discussion uh, format, where you'll be able to pose your questions to a panel of experts, uh, including uh, our presenter today. And um, they typically um, have a much more kind of fluid uh, format. Um, then additionally, the November 18th webinar is coming up, New Directions in Wraparound Accountability and Quality Assurance, and that's going to be uh, talking a little bit about the new Wraparound Fidelity Index short form, or the WIFI EZ, uh, how it's performing, and some of the findings that uh, have been um, realized from its initial use. The webinar is also going to introduce um, a new tablet-based approach for collecting fidelity data that has had extremely good success in uh, being efficient and getting good response rates for the fidelity measure. And then also uh, the webinar is going to introduce a new comprehensive assessment of wraparound implementation at the organizational level, and that combines multiple multiple sources of data to look at basically overall performance in terms of wraparound, including fidelity outcomes and overall implementation quality. And just to sort of note, if you're interested in today's topic, you might also be interested particularly in the April webinar that is archived uh, on the NWI website. Uh, that webinar was on cost and cost effectiveness in wraparound, and it uh, summarizes recent studies, uh, both formal studies and uh, evaluations on this topic. And again, you can access the slides as well as the recorded webinar on the NWI page. So that brings us to today's webinar, um, which is going to be a presentation of some of the findings from a scan of, of high-quality wraparound programs, and this was work done by our partner, um, the Center for Healthcare Strategies, or CHCS, and I'm 
personally actually extremely excited about the volume of interesting and useful data that uh, was gathered and presented in the full report. So you may want to check that out because really today we're only going to get into a small amount or scratching the surface of what's available in that report. Um, you can check it out. I think uh, we're going to be getting information about uh, how to access that on the CHCS website. It's also cross-posted on the NWI website. And there will be a series of uh, mini reports or snapshots on specific topics uh, within the report. And if you want to hear about those, again, keep an eye on the newsletter for more information. Uh, apparently there are three that are already prepared and will be coming out very soon. And probably some additional ones coming out next year. So uh, next slide, please. I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's presenter, Diana Simmons. I'm sorry, Simons, um, who is a, a senior program officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, uh, who is also uh, that organization, a core partner in the TA Network for Children's Behavioral Health. Diana serves as CHCS's lead on the TA Network. Uh, importantly for today's webinar, Diana has an extraordinary depth of experience with and knowledge about wraparound and care management entities, or CMEs, uh, which you'll be hearing about today. At CHCS, she's currently responsible for project oversight of a five-year multi-state quality collaborative focused on the implementation and expansion of the CME approach to the coordination of services and supports for children with serious behavioral health care challenges, health challenges involved in multiple systems and their families. And this uh, project is funded by Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Prior to joining CHCS, uh, Diana worked for the Office of Behavioral Health for uh, MassHealth, which is Massachusetts' version of Medicaid, where she served as acting lead for all the children's uh, behavioral health initiative activities. And prior to that, she oversaw the state's pilot CME uh, slash wraparound initiatives. Um, and also she began her career as a clinician treating at-risk children, youth, and their families. So with that, I would like to uh, turn the uh, webinar over to Diana, who will uh, take it from here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Janet. I appreciate the warm welcome. Um, uh, my name is Diana Simons, as Janet introduced me. And um, John, if you can move the next slide, please. Um, and I work at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, and this is sort of our, our, uh, our, our first slide for all presentations. The center was established in 1995 through a major grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to improve the underpinnings of the nation's healthcare safety net. And um, our mission is basically to find opportunities to improve the Medicaid delivery system so that all of the beneficiaries get the right care from the right providers at the right time. And we're delighted to be core partners in the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, as Janet mentioned. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, it's on there. I apologize. My uh, my internet is a little bit slow. So, um, in large part, the idea for developing the operational resource that we're going to talk about today uh, for states on intensive care coordination using high fidelity wraparound came from our work on the Check for Care Management Entity Collaborative uh, that Janet mentioned briefly. For the past five years, we've been working with Maryland, Georgia, and Wyoming on a quality improvement demonstration grant project that was funded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to implement or expand care management entities. And we amassed a significant amount of operational information about care management entities and programs as a result of the TA we were asked to provide. Um, and the, the gracious uh, work, you know, graciousness of folks like Bruce Camrad and folks with, that are in established uh, CME programs across the country, the state of Massachusetts, the state of New Jersey, the state of Louisiana, all of whom have been hosts for uh, this collaborative that has been learning for the last five years on how to expand or implement man uh, care management entities. Um, Sheila Pyres, who was supposed to be on today's webinar, is our lead consultant for the Chipra CME Collaborative and suggested a long time ago that we call through and pull together the information we had amassed into an operational resource. Um, it was a great idea, as most of Sheila's ideas are, but no easy task given how individualized these programs are and the amount of information we wanted to capture about each of them. So it took us quite a while. But the resource was actually published in July and made its debut at the Georgetown Institute. Um, and we're thrilled that it's been so well received. Next slide, please. 
So had Sheila been on today, she would have spoken uh, about the larger context of healthcare reform and the interest and the need that states have for more customized care coordination approaches for their chronic populations, including children with significant behavioral health conditions, and that intensive care coordination and wraparound offers a care coordination approach for this population, including children and child welfare, with an evidence base that can produce better quality and cost outcomes. She was co-author on a national analysis of Medicaid utilization and expenditures using Medicaid claims data from 2005 called um, The Faces of Medicaid, which some of you may be familiar with, that was published by the center last year, that confirmed what she and many of us have suspected and been saying for a very long time, that children in Medicaid using behavioral health services are a high-cost population and actually look more like adult chronic population in terms of their expenditures. Um, and this slide illustrates some of those points. Their mean expenditures are nearly five times higher than Medicaid children in general. For TANF enrolled kids, it's nearly three times higher. And for children in foster care, it's seven times higher. Unlike adults with a serious persistent mental illness, though, expenditures are driven more by behavioral health than physical health services, except for children on SSI who have slightly higher physical health expenses. Um, children with the top 10% of behavioral health expenses are 28 times more expensive than Medicaid children in general. Um, just as an aside, we're working on an updated analysis now using 2008 data, and we hope to be able to share that information in the not too distant future. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, children in Medicaid using behavioral health services look more like adults in chronic populations in terms of um, their expenditures, but they're distinct from adults with serious and persistent mental illness in several ways that impact the type of care coordination they require in order to affect outcomes. Children with severe behavioral health needs don't have the same high rates of comor comorbid physical health conditions as adults with SPMI. They have different mental health diagnoses from adults with uh, SPMI. There's a lot less schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar disorder and more attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, conduct disorders, anxiety, and their diagnoses change often. Two-thirds um, of the children are typically involved in child welfare and or juvenile justice systems, and 60% may be in special education. These are systems that are governed by legal mandates that must be upheld and coordinated with. Um, and to improve the cost, cost and quality of care, focus needs to be not only on the child, but the family and caregiver as well, which takes additional time. So a care coordinator's time when working with children or youth with serious behavioral health conditions is primarily spent on coordination with other children's systems, the child welfare, juvenile justice, schools, et cetera, behavioral health providers, the family's needs and concerns, and not coordination with primary care, which is the focus of care coordination for most adults with severe and persistent mental illness. Next slide, please. Uh, all this to say that customized intensive care coordination approaches are needed and traditional case management and care coordination approaches used with adults are not sufficient when working with children and youth with severe behavioral health needs. Um, in order to achieve desired outcomes uh, like improved cost and quality and increased ability to remain in the home and in school, care coordination needs to have a lower care coordinator ratio uh, Care coordinator to child and family ratio, it's typically 1 to 10. There's a need for higher payment rates that account for care coordinator time on development and facilitation of child and family teams and required face-to-face -face contact with children and their caregivers and the system partners. There's a need for an approach that is based on um, evidence of effectiveness that can be tracked using standardized tools and wraparound is increasingly considered evidence-based. Uh, the state of Oregon uh, inventory of evidence-based practices has wraparound in there. California Clearinghouse for Effective Child Welfare Practices includes wraparound, as does Washington's Institute for Public Policy, um, which considers full fidelity wraparound for research-based practice. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Examples of these customized intensive care coordination approaches include care management entities, which are basically organizational entities that serve as centralized, accountable hubs to coordinate care for youth with complex behavioral health challenges who are involved in multiple systems in their families. 
The next slide, uh, slide shows a range of uh, service and administrative functions that CMEs engage in, but at a, at a service level, a key function that CMEs engage in is providing intensive care coordination at low ratios using a high quality wraparound care planning approach, um, as, as is done in places like New Jersey, Louisiana, Massachusetts, and Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. Um, the other approach is high quality wraparound teams that are embedded in organizations like community mental health centers, um, federally qualified health centers or school-based mental health centers that provide intensive care coordination, again, at low ratios. And an example of that would be Oklahoma. Using these approaches, um, states are actually seeing better outcomes and lower per capita costs. Um, the results of the 1915C Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facility Home and Community-Based Services Demonstration Waiver that was funded by CMS not long ago um, saw that across the first year of the PRTF demonstration and through year three of the evaluation, all states taken together had demo costs around 32% of the average per capita total Medicaid cost for services in the psych residential treatment facilities. And there was an average per capita savings of somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000 across the state and all the demonstration projects remained cost effective. Um, there were several peer TF states, including Maryland and Georgia, two of the states participating in our collaborative. Um, Wraparound Milwaukee has great results. They've seen a 60% reduction in recidivism rates for delinquent youth from one year prior to enrollment to one year post-enrollment. They've seen decrease in average daily population in residential treatment centers from 375 to 50. A reduction in psychiatric inpatient days from 5,000 days per year to under 200. And an average monthly cost uh, per use of $4,200 compared to $7,200 for residential treatment center, $6,000 for juvenile detention, and $18,000 for psychiatric hospitalization. From 2007 to 2010, New Jersey saw savings of around $40 million by reducing the use of acute inpatient psychiatric services. And during that same time period, their residential treatment budget was reduced by 15% and the length of stay in residential treatment centers decreased by 25%. So pretty good outcomes. Next slide, please. So this is a slide I mentioned that shows the range of service and administrative level functions that care management entities undertake. In some cases, all of these functions functions rest in the CME, as in wraparound Milwaukee. In others, like New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Louisiana, for example, they're shared with uh, managed care organizations, or the state, or both. Next slide. So now to the SCAN. Um, the SCAN of intensive care coordination programs using high-quality wraparound included care management entities and wraparound teams. In terms of our methodology, we sent 25 surveys out to 22 programs, and in, I'm sorry, 25 surveys out, and 22 programs in 15 states responded. Um, we developed a survey covering operational aspects of intensive care coordination wraparound programs and sent it to state and county representatives via email, and the responses that we received were compiled into the individual state uh, county profiles. That sounds fairly straightforward, but I want to underscore the challenge in identifying individuals with a level of operational detail we were looking for who are often embedded within state agencies and county organizations and university staff. And um, so it, it, they, these are highly individualized programs, and it's no wonder because they originate in systems of care philosophy, which is highly individualized. Um, and there really is no one common language being used by everyone for everything we were looking for. So it was, um, it was a fun challenge at times to try and get to the right person in the right agency who could answer the right question. We asked the programs to self-identify into three categories that included established programs that had been in existence for some time, have outcomes data, and have a continuous quality improvement process established. Um, evolving programs that have established approaches in parts of the state and are either expanding the statewide or revamping um, some part or all of their approach, and emerging programs, uh, which are brand new in the early stages of development. Next slide, please. Uh, we asked what populations of the programs uh, serve. They serve K-12 
kids with serious behavioral health needs, obviously, with substance abuse issues, co-occurring co -occurring disorders. They serve age ranging from 0 to 25 um, Medicaid-eligible children and youth um, that are uh, involved with or at risk for involvement in multiple systems, including child welfare, juvenile justice, special, special education, or all of the above, um, and that are at risk uh, for out-of-home or institutional placement or coming out of um, out of home or institutional placement. Um, last year, New Jersey expanded their children's system of care to include children and youth with developmental and intellectual disabilities and children with primary substance use disorder. Uh, care management entities in New Jersey, which they call care management organizations or CMOs, now serve those populations of children in addition to those with serious behavioral health needs. So that's a, a huge step to include a, far broader populations than previously had been included. Next slide, please. This slide, I'm not going to spend too much time on. In terms of eligibility screening and assessment, um, the tools uh, ran the gamut, um, included medical necessity criteria that is used by some states, state-specific tools in the CANS, the CASIS, Ohio scale, CBCL, some use more than one. Um, tool for um, screening and, and assessment. Um, and the entities that are responsible for screening and assessment range from managed care organization to the state Medicaid agency to the CME itself to private nonprofit organizations and um, child welfare agencies in the case of uh, Rhode Island and um, Illinois and also uh, contracted system administrators called administrative service organizations or ASO. Um, as is done in New Jersey. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the functions often delegated to managed care organization in Medicaid managed care is the establishment of medical necessity criteria for services. And because of the lawsuit that brought about the redesign of the children's home and community-based services in, and the implementation of intensive care coordination with high fidelity wrap route in Massachusetts, the state developed uniform medical necessity criteria for the remedy services um, and compelled its six managed care organizations to use the same criteria. That's not common and not usual, um, and that's why we're highlighting Massachusetts as that. Um, as I mentioned, Illinois and Rhode Island um, are both emerging programs. They do not use standardized tools to determine eligibility. In Illinois, two state agencies are piloting CMEs, their Department of Children and Family Services, or their Child Welfare Department, and Healthcare and Family Services, their Medicaid um, agency. So eventually, the, the state hopes to have one unified approach across agencies. Um, but at this point, children and youth are identified by case managers either within the Department of Children and Families for that pilot or in uh, private contracted agencies um, for the Medicaid um, pilot. And eligibility is based on the level of placement. Um, in Rhode Island, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families authorizes enrollment primarily for children and youth between 6 and 18 years of age involved with the department and residing in congregate care settings or treatment foster care. Once the children are enrolled, uh, both in Illinois and Rhode Island, uh, both states use the CAMP. Um, Rhode Island uses the Ohio Scales, Ages and Stages, North Carolina Family Assessment as well. But, um, they don't have anything to determine enrollment like other states use the CASI or the CANS for that purpose. Next slide, please. Um, we looked, as uh, Janet had mentioned, care coordinator staffing ratios is one of the, the quick snapshots that's going to come out um, later on this year. Um, and we looked at uh, staffing ratios, and one characteristic that distinguishes intensive care coordination from conventional or adult-focused care coordination, if you will, is the low ratio of care coordinators to children and families. Um, it's much lower than the ratio for traditional care coordination, which can be as high as 1 to 250. Um, that number comes from um, Missouri's patient-centered medical home, which, which has that as a, a care coordinator to, to client ratio. In intensive care coordination approaches that use high quality wraparound, the care coordinator to family ratio, as I mentioned, typically doesn't exceed 1 to 10, which is important given the frequency of required face-to-face -face interaction between wraparound care coordinators and children and families. 
Um, in conventional care coordination, contact can be infrequent. It can be monthly or quarterly or occur largely by telephone. In intensive care coordination using high-quality wraparound, care coordinators are required to maintain a minimum number of hours per week of face-to-face -face interaction with children and families. Um, in programs that provide intensive care coordination for expanded populations of children and youth, uh, with both moderate and severe behavioral health needs, um, New Jersey or the Illinois Medicaid population, for example. The ratio may be higher or tiered based on intensity of need. But even in those approaches, um, ratios don't typically exceed 1 to 16 across the population. And the lower ratios are seen for children with more serious challenges and needs. Next slide, please. So this is just a slide of the snapshot that uh, we're going to be putting out that, that gives you a quick look at all of the states that participated and what their ratios are. Next slide, please. Supervisors may or may not function as RAP facilitators themselves, uh, but their knowledge and understanding of the wraparound process and its phases and components is essential to the um, to their oversight and support of care coordinators working directly with families and kids. So the supervisor's role is focused on monitoring the quality of the implementation of the wraparound process often. It may also consist of monitoring the progress of the child and family team goals in meeting the family's needs. And in addition, supervisors are also um, often responsible for monitoring the mix of services and interventions offered to children and families and ensuring that natural supports are included in the types of services being offered. So you know, we know that outcomes show that implementation of care coordination using wraparounds without adherence to fidelity does not yield the intended results and benefits for families and children. For this reason, the scope of work for peer coordinator supervisors can extend beyond the individual direction or management of peer coordinators. Um, this is reflected in the lower supervisor to peer coordinator ratios in intensive peer coordination programs using high fidelity wraparound, which range in our scan from 1 to 2 to 1 to 12, except in Michigan where there's no standardized ratio. Um, then in other settings in which a supervisor's sole responsibility is limited to the individual supervision. Um, needs of the staff, for instance. Next slide, please. And then this again is the snapshot um, that will be coming out as a standalone with a, um, a bit of narrative around it, but it gives you the range of supervisor to care coordinator ratios across the programs we profiled. Next slide, please. We also took a look at um, the role of system partners. Uh, specifically family and youth peer support um, and psychiatric consultation as a part of uh, these intensive care coordination programs. In general, family and youth peer support is recognized as important and is offered by all the programs, but not every program requires it, and it's supported in different ways. Um, some programs, like uh, Louisiana, Massachusetts, and Michigan, fund peer support through their Medicaid state plan amendment. Uh, New Jersey uses its Medicaid administrative funds, and other programs use state funds or grant funding. In states like Illinois, where peer support is not a Medicaid covered service, it can be built under other Medicaid reimbursable services, such as community support. Um, the role of psychiatry, which is important, especially as it relates to the use of psychotropic medications with children, and especially children and child welfare, uh, varied across programs. Not all the programs offer psychiatric consultation, though many link with existing providers who may be invited to participate in child and family teams as appropriate. Massachusetts, for example, requires two to eight hours a week of consultation in which the psychiatrist is available to the care coordinators for consultation, training, communication with other medica medical professionals, um, and participation on care planning teams. What's clear and distinct, though, is that the role of psychiatry does not include either review or sign off on plans of care. So none of the programs require that. So there, there is a role for psychiatry for advanced practice nurses, but it's more consultation and coordination as opposed to um, that sign-off or MDT function that, that is more traditional. Next slide, please. Um, so financing approaches vary. Uh, rates for care coordination vary. Um, 
And unlike conventional adult-focused care coordination, intensive care coordination using high-quality wraparound requires, I'm going to say this again until I'm blue in the face, requires low care coordination, care coordinated of child and family ratios, um, high frequency of face-to-face -face contact, and the facilitation of child and family teams, and coordination of activities across multiple systems. Um, and because of this, rates for intensive care coordination using the wraparound approach for children with complex behavioral health needs tend to be higher, um, significantly higher sometimes than those for traditional care coordination. Um, however, the duration of intensive care coordination tends to be shorter for children and youth with average lengths of stay um, between 7 and 18 months. Uh, children and child welfare are sometimes longer, but um, for the most part, uh, kids get discharged from care coordination, where adults with care coordination, more traditional and certainly in managed care, care coordination, they tend to stay for much longer, if not for life. Um, rates can be structured in a number of ways, including as case rates, paid daily, monthly, annually, or per episode of care to the provider or to the managed care organization, or actually to both. Uh, Louisiana is an example of a state that pays an administrative um, payment um, to both their wraparound agencies and also to their um, managed care organization that functions as an administrative services organization. Case rates can be limited to funding only care coordination with high quality wraparound or can include um, other supports and services such as family and youth care support, other home and community-based services, inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, psychiatric residential treatment, etc. Um, All-inclusive rates that would cover all of what I just mentioned, and, and, as it's done in um, Milwaukee County, cover the cost of intensive care coordination in addition to everything that's necessary in terms of services and support. Rates for intensive care coordination can also be um, remunerated fee-for-service, as they are in Massachusetts, in which a specific dollar amount is paid per unit or time increment. In Massachusetts, it's per 15-minute unit. That's very common fee-for-service unit in Medicaid. Um, in addition, rates may or may not have uh, a daily, weekly, or monthly, or annual cap on the services. So there could, could be those caps, there could not be. Those are arrangements done at, at the program state level, basically, with the program. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of the snapshot on care coordination rates and billing structure. That's another one of those um, snapshot resources that's going to be coming out later this year uh, that we hope to have available to you in, in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, financing approaches, approaches vary. Sources for financing uh, obviously include Medicaid, the 1115 waivers, the 1915A, B, and C waivers, state plan amendments, money follows the person, balancing incentives program. Georgia is actually a state that uses both money follows the person and the balancing incentives program to fund their care management entity, their wraparound program, um, or did until recently. Um, and uh, state general funds are also used, child welfare dollars, juvenile justice grants, SAMHSA block grants, system of care grants, um, local revenues, public health dollars, substance use tax dollars, county tax match, and uh, uh, pooled and blended funding. So I want to highlight Livingston County in Michigan because they've tailored and expanded on the state's wraparound program to serve the needs of its children and families. Um, in several distinct ways. So the, the county has established a human service collaborative that's made up of 26 appointed members from its health and human services agencies. They work together to coordinate services across these systems. The collaborative is, among other things, responsible for overseeing the provision of intensive care coordination with high fidelity wraparound in the county. Another cross-agency body, the community consultation team, which consists of designated system partners from mental health, child welfare, the schools, substance abuse, juvenile courts, public health and family representatives, is responsible for authorizing enrollment in wraparound services. So it's got that um, conflict-free case management function there. Livingston County uses a unique blended funding mechanism to provide um, intensive care coordination and wraparound services. They blend funds from Medicaid, both 1915B and 1915C waivers. They have general revenue, state mental health, state child welfare, state match of county child care funding, and local revenue, public health, substance use tax dollars, um, 
county court allocation and child welfare court allocation. Um, and financial um, and outcomes data are presented every month to the funding partners. Over the last 10 years, uh, youth enrolled in Wraparound in Livingston County has showed improved functioning on the child um, uh, on the CAFIS um, by an average of 38 points, which is double the amount considered statistically significant. And the 10-year average for children in Livingston County's wraparound program who stayed in a community placement or moved to a less restrictive placement is 79%. So um, their wraparound program serves between 60 and 80 families annually with an 11-month average length of involvement. So those are some incredible outcomes from um, one county in Michigan. Um, in Milwaukee, Wraparound Milwaukee is a special managed Medicaid managed care entity. They used a 1915A to allow for a voluntary managed care system for a defined population in a defined geographical area, in this case, Milwaukee County. Um, Wisconsin also has a really robust emergency mental health crisis benefit, and that is build fee-for-service for the crisis component or the mobile urgent treatment team um, that's part of Wraparound Milwaukee. Um, Wraparound Milwaukee pools funds across child serving systems. It was $54 million in 2014 um, in order to increase flexibility and availability of funding. They're the single payer. Um, they have uh, child welfare dollars that are funded through case rates. They have juvenile justice dollars that um, are funds budgeted for residential treatment and juvenile corrections placement. Um, they have a Medicaid capitation of uh, about 1900 per enrollee per month. And as I mentioned, mental health, they do crisis billing um, fee-for-service. They also have a healthy transition initiative grant and an HMO commercial insurer as well. So the purpose of combining categorical funds from different sources and agencies into one single funding stream is to gain more flexibility in how these funds can be spent on individual services. Because once blended, these funds are indistinguishable. And that's how Milwaukee uses it. Next slide, please. Um, staff training and development um, is important. Wraparound certification and uh, training is required by several of the programs. Um, the University of Maryland works in different states. They work in Louisiana. They've worked all over, but um, that's one of the organizations that is used for wraparound training. Another is Boone Vandenberg. That name came up uh, pretty frequently, and uh, states have taken on the train the trainer approach as well. Wyoming is a state that um, had Boone Vandenberg trained for high fidelity wraparound initially, and then they trained coaches internally, and now those coaches have taken over the training. Um, states require certification sometimes, not always, and skill and um, competency competency based trainings. Sometimes those are provided by the state. Sometimes they're provided by uh, provider agencies. Sometimes they're included in managed care contracts and, and required to be um, as part of the managed care component. Um, and uh, all of the programs we looked at uh, required CAN certification um, and ongoing supervision, either individual group diet or sometimes all, uh, all of those um, and more. So it was variable. Um, but all of the states were um, very invested in understanding that, and all of the communities, because it's not just states, were invested in community and staff training and development. We actually hope to have uh, one of our snapshots for next year to delve more deeply into the details around that. Next slide, please. We looked at provider networks. Um, the entities that are responsible for provider network development. And again, that ran the gamut. It wasn't the same in every place. There were managed care organizations that were responsible, in, like in Louisiana and Massachusetts. In Michigan, the prepaid inpatient health plans were responsible for provider network development. There were had uh, regional behavioral health authorities in Nebraska, um, in uh, New Jersey and in Georgia, the state entity or agency, the Children's System of Care and New Jersey and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities in Georgia were, were responsible. Care management entity like Wraparound Milwaukee and more recently the care management entity contracted in Illinois responsible for provider network development. I think that's choices. 
Um, and also an administrative services organization like in El Paso County, Colorado is responsible for developing the network of providers um, for intensive care coordination with high fidelity wraparound programs. Next slide, please. Evaluation, monitoring, and outcomes were uh, also topics that we looked at. Um, there are a few proprietary electronic health records systems out there. Uh, New Jersey has developed their own. Uh, it's called Cyber, and um, uh, it escapes me what it's Children Use Behavioral Something Record, uh, Electronic Record. <laughs> Um, and uh, then there's Choices Proprietary uh, Electronic Record, which is called Clinical Manager. Um, Wraparound Milwaukee has developed their own called Synthesis. There have been programs that have purchased uh, Synthesis, and um, then there are other uh, programs that have created their own that have purchased uh, off-the-shelf electronic records as well. Um, Utilization management is sometimes delegated to the managed care organization. It's sometimes the function of an administrative services organization, as in Louisiana and uh, New Jersey. And uh, sometimes it's the function of the care management entity. And uh, sometimes it's shared uh, across both. They have service level and administrative functions in terms of utilization management. And the service level can be with the CME and the um, the uh, administrative function can be with uh, the managed care organization. Um, but for the most part, ASOs, MCOs, and the CME are typically the responsible parties around for utilization management. Evaluation and monitoring is often done in partnership with universities. In Ohio, Case Western Reserve is the partner that does the evaluation for um, uh, their intensive care coordination with high fidelity wraparound program. In Georgia, Georgia State University has um, become their center of excellence and they're taking on more and more in terms of both evaluation but also data um, as well reporting functions. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's the University of Pittsburgh and uh, in Maryland, it's the University of Maryland that has um, the, the responsibility for the evaluation of the intensive care coordination programs. And um, in, in many of these cases, they're gathering quite robust data and working very closely with the state agencies um, in terms of improving the quality um, and managing the, the utilization and uh, providing real-time information to the care management entities themselves as well. Next slide, please. So the key takeaways from across all programs is that one size definitely does not fit all. Um, as I said before, I would not have expected there to be a cookie cutter approach because systems of care are so highly individualized and I would have expected to mirror the systems of care um, philosophy and implementation. And that's definitely the case. Um, however, early and ongoing stakeholder engagement seems to be a key to very successful implementation. Um, bringing people to the table and keeping them at the table and keeping them engaged, and that's stakeholders across um, state agencies and strong relationships that are built over time uh, seem to be key. Uh, learning the languages of state agencies and funders, providers, um, and others really facilitates collaboration. Um, I talk about this a fair amount that um, systems, we all have our own acronyms. Everybody functions sort of in our own um, silos, even when we're trying to break the silos down. And when we say wraparound, we expect everybody to understand what wraparound is. Wraparound in Medicaid is a um, completely different thing. And care coordination in managed care and care coordination on the adult side means something completely different than intensive care coordination with a high fidelity wraparound approach. Um, so making sure that we are speaking the languages of our agency partners is key. Um, making sure that they understand where we're coming from when we say wraparound, where, where we're coming from when we say um, care coordination is essential because people have already formed ideas about what you mean and it won't make sense that you're asking for a rate that's four times higher than the care coordination rate that they pay for adults. Um, so that's key. And then also uh, thinking about sustainability from the very beginning. It's looking out into the future and um, and thinking about the end of the grant or the end of the funding and how it's going to 
um, be sustained beyond that is something that um, these programs that have been around a while, especially the uh, established programs, have done a lot of thinking about um, and continually thinking about from the very beginning. So um, next slide, please. This resource, which is um, fairly lengthy, it's about 60 pages long, is available um, at uh, the CHCS website. Um, and NWI has a copy of it also on their website. Um, another resource I would recommend would be the Care Management Entities, a primer. Um, it's a, a basically just a, a one-pager, and it's great for working with agency partners and folks that don't have a lot of time to spare uh, to try and figure out what it is you mean when you say care management entity or intensive care coordination um, approach. And uh, coming soon, as Janet mentioned, the quick reference snapshots on intensive care coordination using high quality wraparound. One is on the care coordination rates and billing structure. The other is on supervisor to care coordination, care coordinator ratios, and the other is on care coordinator to child and family ratios. So I think, next slide, that's it for my presentation. Well, that was great. and. Um, I learned quite a bit from that, uh, despite having seen the signs, uh, the s slides, excuse me, I'm, I seem to be having little uh, tongue slips today, uh, prior to the presentation. So actually there are not a ton of questions, um, but uh, if you have a question now, uh, remember you can chat it in. And I'm going to just ask a couple of the ones that were chatted in earlier. So we have a question, are, are any trauma-focused screening tools used, and if so, which ones? Um, that's a very good question, and I would have to go through each one of these pages um, to see which tools are identified by each state. I want to say yes, um, but that would be a guess. The, the screening tools that were used most often are the ones that we put on the slide. So the ones that are up there, the CASI, the XC, the CAFIS, the CANS, um, are the ones that are used, but that does not mean that there isn't one that's uh, focused on trauma. So I'm sorry. I, I can get that information, but not, not on the spot. I'd have to go through the guide. Okay. Or the questioner, you could look at the guide yourself to see if uh, maybe mm -hmm. do a search of that PDF for a name or trauma or something like that. Yep. Um, so we also have several questions. Remind me where I can access the slides. So the slides themselves as well as a recording of the webinar will be available probably within the next couple hours on the NWI website. That's nwi.pdx.edu or just search NWI Wraparound. Um, how is data shared across systems in the more successful ICCs? Um, that's a really good question. So uh, they have, in New Jersey, they use cyber, and everybody uses cyber. So cyber belongs to the state of New Jersey, and the ASO uses it, and the CMOs use it, and, and it all goes into that one system. Same thing with Wraparound Milwaukee. They use synthesis. They created synthesis. It's both for their, their um, you know, their electronic health record practices, but also for quality measurement, those kinds of things. So um, the, the states in which they have, and, and the states in which Choices operates, they have clinical manager, which, which they use. Um, and so in states where it works really well, there's either the use of the same uh, system or um, work that's done to ensure a smooth interface between systems. So, you know, in Massachusetts, there, there are uh, six managed care organizations. Each of them have sort of proprietary functions, but there's um, the state compelled the utilization managers, you know, the, the, the coordinators that, that interface with the care management entities to use the CANs for all um, authorization processes. So they use the same format. It's the CANs questions that the care coordinators ask. The, the families and children are then fed to the the um, the managed care reviewers, and the language is, is the same, and that's entered into the, the the system. So, to the extent that if the actual platform or the actual um, electronic record can't be the same, that the language that's used in the the care management entities record is recognized and also used by the authorizer of care makes a huge difference. 
So, and here's a question, what typically happens to the care coordinator uh, when children go into hospitals, PRTF detention, etc.? Uh, what typically happens to them? I think they mean what happens to the care coordination process or how do you account for that perhaps in the funding, etc.? Well, the care coordination function does not um, cease to exist when a kid goes into the hospital. So, for instance, um, you know, a care coordinator wouldn't necessarily discharge. They would work with the inpatient facility as they've worked with other providers of care. Um, they would work to make sure that they, uh, the PRTF or the residential, you know, or, or the, the inpatient provider understands that this child has a coordinated plan of care, that there are strengths and needs, that there's a goal, that there are people, you know, there's a child and family team that makes decisions. So in terms of a short-term uh, stay anywhere, the care coordinator continues to do the work. Um, in terms of the amount of time and duplication, if that's the question, around duplication, uh, different programs approach that differently. You know, um, there's, if you go in for more than 90 days, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, you, you, you would get discharged and then, you know, you could re-engage once you were discharged from that residential stay. Um, so different places handle it in different ways. But the, for a short-term hospitalization or short-term removal from home, the work continues and the care coordinator doesn't necessarily delegate that or, or lose that function. So let's see, here's another question. Um, can you discuss any examples of braided funding between private and public entities to finance CMEs or wraparound? I wish I could. <laughs> um, I don't, uh, nothing comes to mind immediately. I mean, I know that uh, Wraparound Milwaukee has had um, a private insurer um, relationship, but I don't know the extent of that, and I think Bruce would probably be a better person to ask about that. Mm -hmm. um, are care-managed organizations ever the providers of ICC? Are care management organizations, yes. Uh, so in New Jersey, care management organizations are solely providers of intensive care coordination. Um, that's all they do. They don't provide any other services. There's one in every county. Um, same thing in Louisiana. They have wraparound. They call them wraparound agencies. All they do is provide care coordination. Um, and uh, whether the question is, can a CME do other things? The answer is yes. In Massachusetts, the care management entities are uh, basically nonprofit behavioral health providers. They have other books of business that can include in, you know, outpatient psychiatric or one of the um, uh, home and community-based services as well. So yeah, they can. So um, if a state, here's a, if a state or county is interested in starting an ICC model, what resources are available to assist them? And I'm going to, I'm going to start uh, with directing the person asking that question to the NWI website, there's certainly a lot of resources on there, um, and particularly to the implementation guide for Wraparound, which kind of goes over things that need to get going on all sorts of different sort of main fronts, or we call them the themes of Wraparound implementation, all the way from working with your state and the larger system and policy context to training staff um, and managing data, et cetera. Um, Diana, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would, um, I would also add to that the um, Sheila's primer, the Building Systems of Care, mm -hmm. a primer. The second edition, it takes you through financing and planning and, and uh, all, all the steps related to systems of care, but, but systems of care are sort of, it's, it's the basis for uh, intensive care coordination and wraparound programs, so that's definitely a great resource as well. Yeah. Um, are there any Medicaid managed care organizations like WellCare, Amerigroup, et cetera, that operate wraparound programs? I don't know of any managed care organizations that, wrap, that uh, manage wraparound programs. I, most managed care organizations provide care coordination, and that's sort of the tricky thing is that they think they do, but they don't because that, that gets into the language piece. The, the care coordination within the context of managed care 
means something different than it, it means in um, systems of care or, you know, the wraparound with high fidelity that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I don't oh. know of any. Mm -hmm. Um, here's someone who wants more information about the role of the supervisor um, that didn't get it all down. I don't know if you uh, might want to direct them to a part of the report or hit some of the highlights or anything. Um, so the supervisors in, in high fidelity wraparound programs uh, in intensive care coordinations with high fidelity wraparound, supervisors are not solely responsible usually for individual supervision. They're, they're usually um, responsible for other components of the fidelity to the model, to the, the high, high quality wrap model. So for that reason, their ratios of, care, of supervisor to care coordinator tend to be lower because they're monitoring a number of different things that are not, not only individual care coordinator and how they're doing, but other components as well. One of the snapshots that we're going to be putting out shortly is on supervisor to care coordinator, to care coordinator ratio, so I would just say stay tuned for that. Um, it's you know, imminent, sort of before the end of the year, for sure, those will be out. So that, that will be that. That's my answer. <laughs> OK, great. Um, here's another one. Have you compiled and analyzed the definitions of intensive care coordination in different states? The definitions of what needs to be included may be very different in different places. And in some states, uh, apparently California, it can be provided outside the wraparound program or embedded in it. Um, in some states, it's a Medicaid-funded service under EPSDT. Yes, very good question. So there are several states that have defined intensive care coordinator, or I should say, they have defined their targeted case management to be intensive care coordination. Uh, one of the states that does that is Massachusetts. So they took targeted case management and, and stru used, basically structured the language so that um, what targeted case management is, is intensive care coordination. It, it's not a generic thing that you could then plug it into. Different states do it different ways, um, and uh, we have not compiled all of them, certainly, but if um, that person wants to shoot me an email, I can certainly send them uh, some uh, targeted case management um, definitions. Uh, New Jersey is also a state that, that's done that. They define tar um, intensive care coordination on the targeted case management. Um, how do children consent to care coordination in these existing states, mainly concerning sharing protected health information via health information technology? Uh, that's a really good question. They are um, beholden to the same um, uh, release of information and, and HIPAA um, requirements that everybody else is, and the, the providers basically, if a child is young enough, the parent signs, or the, the child after a certain age has to sign, and, and different states have different rules, I think, around substance use and also HIV stuff as well, so, so that gets tricky, but it's, it's the, the care coordination entity, whatever it is, the, the RAP facilitation agency needs to make sure that they have all those releases in place. And that there is con there's an appropriate consent for whatever the service is. Mm -hmm. Do any of the ICC models work with the parent or family to assume the role of care coordination? Um, I think that's the goal of high fidelity wraparound. Um, <laughs> the the process is an an education and empowerment process for the the parent or caregiver to assume that role ultimately and that's that's sort of when graduation happens in a lot of these programs but that's based on my understanding of high fidelity wraparound um, so yes I mean as a, a child and I'm actually thinking of an example in Georgia as the child progressed through the CME the father was able to take more and more of a role in in coordination of the child and family team and at a certain point he made the decision that he was able to manage all those functions that the care coordinator was facilitating and they didn't need ICC anymore. So that, that's the goal, I think, for most families. And finally, what factors typically determine the duration of care coordination? Um, fidelity to the model, <laughs> for starters. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, Typically, it's the amount of um, 
uh, system involvement that a child has. So I, I think I mentioned on one of the slides that it's sort of an average of between 7 and, and 18 months. And the, the longer uh, time frame, the 18-month the time frame, is often for kids involved in child welfare that may have placement issues or maybe transitioning. Um, it's often kids who are multi-system involved where there are several mandates from several agencies and there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen and a lot of negotiation that needs to happen to, to make sure that, that the plan uh, of care and that, that the needs and supports are in place in the right way and people are monitoring them. So um, there's there's a lot of variability in that. I don't, I don't know that I can answer that more, more um, succinctly than what I just said. Yeah, I just want to add, I think it's our experience generally that newer programs uh, enroll kids and families for longer, possibly because they're not uh, as good at what they're doing. And I think also it's often typically true of wraparound programs that they're not um, very focused on transition uh, at the beginning, maybe that makes mm -hmm. uh, kind of logical sense, and that that is one of the kind of capacities of programs that tends to take a little while to develop. Um, and families often um, just as soon stay in wraparound. A lot of families are extremely satisfied with wraparound. So um, if there's not a clear focus on transition, um, it can be unclear, and I think families can kind of linger in wraparound perhaps a little bit longer than in uh, newly established programs than in ones that have been around for a little while longer. Yeah, I think I think your point about the, the fact that um, transition doesn't start from the first minute, I think people um, often perceive wraparound as more of a linear, you know, you have phase one and then you have phase two and then you have phase three. So those programs that have been doing it for longer and really understand that that, that, that transition phase really starts right at about the same time as engagement. Um, seem to have families move through faster. Okay, well actually we're right at noon and uh, I want to again thank Diana for uh, for all the information that she's had and also for speaking so quickly and getting through all the questions in a really efficient manner. Uh, that was uh, quite the grab bag of, of tough topics, so um, that was great. So uh, again, thanks to everyone, thanks for being on the call and um, if you have an outstanding, I see one outstanding question here I will, um, that needs an offline response, so I'll get to that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thanks to everyone for being on the call, and uh, we look forward to the next webinar and hope that you will uh, attend if it's a topic that interests you. Thanks so much. Okay, goodbye everyone.